what's diversity got to do with Wall Street? If any of you have an answer to that question, catch me later, and I'll figure out a way to give you extra credit in life. <laughs> so when I was getting a master's degree, I took a class in sociology, and it was about race, class, and gender. And one of the things that we discussed was the complexity of power, in that in a given day, you might be in a place where you are in a place of power, but then later that day, you could be in a situation where you have no power. Uh, so for, for instance, I worked in an investment bank, and um, within the company, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. But when I walked outside the bank and I told people, I'm an investment banker at Morgan Stanley, suddenly people's eyes lit up like I was somebody important, especially when I was at a bar with a guy who see, seemed to be more interested in my job than they were in me. And I remember we also learned about this concept that when we are in a place of power, it's our responsibility, not, our, not an option, but our responsibility to actually speak up for those who don't have power. And I, when I, I hadn't thought of it that way before, and I remember that really weighed on me. And it's a concept that still both haunts and inspires me. So let me give you a little bit about my background. I've spent many years in the corporate world, and then a couple years ago I decided to trade in my suit and write about my experience in investment banking at Morgan Stanley. And that book is called Suits, A Woman on Wall Street. And it launched earlier this year, and then I did the author thing. I went on a book tour for a couple months, and I met a lot of my readers. And I kind of expected my readers would look, I don't know, like me. A woman, someone in the financial industry, about my age. Uh, and I was just surprised to see so many of my readers were much broader than that. I ran into a lot of men. I ran into a lot of people from vastly different generations. And I ran into a lot of people in a variety of different industries. And what threw me off is not only that I ran into them, but to hear so many people say, I had such a, I had a similar experience. I went through something similar. That threw me off. And it was them who helped me understand that I was speaking about something that was broader. It was about the broader diversity issues that we're facing. And I was speaking in general about what it feels like to feel excluded in an environment. And I was particularly grateful to this one man. I was doing a media interview. And after we got off camera, I, walked out, I was walking out of the studio. And he kind of did this little jog to come up to me. I still remember, because I was wondering why he was coming at me. Um, and he introduced himself, and he said he's, he was a senior executive at the company. Um, he was a, probably in about his 50, 50s. He was a minority. I remember the first thing he said to me was, thank you so much for speaking up for us. And I was just completely thrown off because it was very eye-opening for me because I had no idea that I was speaking for us. So I think partly why I'm sensitive to these issues in diversity is because when I started on Wall Street, I started there as an outsider. I, before that, less than a year before that, I was working at a rundown grocery store in the suburbs in Houston. And I spent my day asking people if they wanted paper or plastic. And then fast forward less than a year, I'm sitting uh, on 60 Wall Street at a mahogany desk with a green Victorian banker's lamp by my side. So how did I get there, you might wonder? Well, I grew up in this Indian immigrant community that I would say is a little obsessed with success. So for me, the question when I was growing up wasn't, are you thinking about a college degree? It was more along the lines of, are you getting a double major? Are you going to be doing a master's back-to-back -back with that bachelor's? So it was only two months before I got that call from my mom, and she asked me, too much after I'd started my freshman year in college, and she asked me, do you have a job? And I thought, I'm just trying to pass chemistry. And there it was, not very long afterwards, I was at a career fair, looking for the internship so I could line up everything, with a resume that my mom had drafted with the right action verbs like leading and designing, even though I had just worked at a grocery store. And I remember walking in that career fair, and I was so nervous, because I didn't, I didn't even know what business was. Um, so I was just so nervous about talking to people. So this first woman that smiled at me, I just walked up to her. And it turned out she was recruiting from New York. 
And she started telling me about their internship program, and she was telling me how they go to Broadway shows, and they dine at New York's finest restaurants, and they have parties as all part of their internship. And I just thought, that sounds fun. I like that. Um, and I had hardly ever left my Houston suburb. I mean, we didn't even go to Houston. We didn't come out, we didn't come out here very often. Um, we, were, we were out in the burbs at the mall. Um, so I remember we had this great conversation. I was so excited about everything she was telling me because New York is like the movies for me. Um, I'd never been there. And at the end of the conversation, she, I said, I'm a freshman. And I mean, from what my mom said, I thought that would be totally appropriate for me to be standing there. And she said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie, that's totally out of the question. Come back to me in a couple years. And I remember she handed me uh, a brochure, and it said J.P. Morgan on it, but I had never heard of that, so I didn't care. But below that, it said 60 Wall Street. And I remember feeling this little tingle because I was talking to this woman from Wall Street, and I was so enamored with that. And so I became very persistent, and I really wanted that internship. So the next time she came on campus, I cornered her, and I told her that I'd already read J.P. Morgan's entire history, all 812 pages of it, and that I'd read How to Read the Wall Street Journal. And so I knew that I'd be able to do any job that any of those other <laughs> Ivy, League, Ivy League juniors that she was going to hire would be able to do. And I said that with a lot of confidence. But the reality was is I had never even taken a business class, and I really didn't have a clue as to what finance was about. But that's okay, because what she said to me was, you know what, one day you're going to be very successful and J.P. Morgan would hate to lose you, so let me see what I can do. And there it was, I got that chance. So for me, I remember when I walked into that J.P. Morgan room, I'd never been to New York City before. I walked into the boardroom and I knew immediately I was out of my element. I was wearing a houndstooth TJ Maxx suit and my Payless shoes. And when I introduced myself and told people I was from Texas, I remember one of the interns looked at me and she, she said, I've never had a friend that lives south of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and when I told people that I was from a public school, when I said I was from University of Texas, first I said UT and then I realized nobody knew what UT was, and then I said University of Texas, and then I got these sad eyes of sympathy that I, sympathy that I was from a public school, and then when I explained to people I'd been part of a public school system the whole time, I remember getting these incredible surprised faces. But I knew very quickly in that environment that I was going to have to work very hard in this crowd to prove myself. So I did a few internships on Wall Street, and then I took a full-time job there. I worked at Morgan Stanley, and I worked in one of the most powerful groups there that is notorious for its hazing culture. And one of my earliest memories there was being on the trading floor, so it's a complete open workspace area where you can see everybody. And on the loudspeaker, like a, a fire drill, it was just very soon after I started working there, there was an announcement that said, there's an unidentifiable object in the building. Evacuate immediately. There's an unidentifiable object in the building. Evacuate immediately. And I looked around and nobody moved. I saw a pregnant woman walk out and I remember just sitting there and people were not going anywhere. And it was then that I learned very early on that if someone senior didn't do something in that environment, you didn't do it. And that's actually why we had so much face time in investment banking, because if you had an officer that was reading the Wall Street Journal till two o'clock in the morning, because that's what they felt like, you were usually sitting right outside their office waiting for them, even though you're doing absolutely nothing. And that really set the tone for me for how hierarchical the culture I was walking into and what a command culture it was. And I wish I could say that was several years ago, which it was, but that so much has changed now, but it's really funny because of that story that I told in my book. Um, I had one of my readers just recently email me a story about the, the radiation, potential radiation threats uh, in Tokyo from the earthquake. And some Goldman employees said that they were very concerned about their family's well-being and their own well-being, so they wanted to leave for a little bit. And um, this is the article, quotes a Goldman Sachs employee. And the quote from the guy is, the message was clear, no one is to leave. And if you do leave, you can't come back and still expect to work for Goldman. So I'm not sure how much cultures have changed. So let me give you a sense of the day-to-day -day dysfunction uh, from the group that I worked in at Morgan Stanley. 
It was the kind of place where you had to give up complete control of your life. And if that meant working 100 hours a week, that's what it was. It wasn't uncommon to spend the night there. It wasn't uncommon to spend a few nights there. And it was actually very cool if you never went home and showered in between. That gave you a lot of credit, and everyone would notice what if you're still wearing the same outfit. Because that would mean you were very hardcore. And you'd stay there even if maybe your officer was waiting. There was going to be a 300-page fax coming in in the middle of the night, and someone didn't want one page missing from that fax. It was a kind of attitude where it was, I had to suffer, so you will suffer. So we'd put up with officers screaming at us because a title was maybe a quarter of an inch off, or because the font size wasn't exactly right, or we didn't have the right shade of blue. And in the end, I remember seeing so much stress around me. I, um, one of my colleagues ended up, and we were in our early 20s, developing vertigo, which is a little unheard of at that age. Um, I watched people become alcoholics, have nervous breakdowns, and liberally pop antidepressants to make it through the day. But there were trade-offs. We worked on billion-dollar deals. We got to mingle with the largest CEOs in the country. We dined at exclusive restaurants, and we got tickets into the top business schools and top corporations in the country. But in the end, the thing about the culture that st stood out to me the most was that it was a kind of culture that was leave your identity at the door. And so not only were people not represented from different demographic groups in our society, it was kind of the unspoken expectation that if there was something different about you, it should probably be left outside that building. And that made me feel really stripped of my identity in order to prove that I was a team player all the time. So I found that I was drinking more than I wanted to drink, that I would say, how amazing, to porn, that I didn't really find that amazing, that I had to drop anything that was feminine because that would make me look weak, and I dropped anything that was southern, especially the word y'all. And I noticed that the faster I did all these things and I assimilated into this culture, the more successful I was. And that made me feel incredibly just disconnected from who I really was. So I worked in banking for a few years, and then I got to work in different corporate cultures, and that really helped give me perspective on what it's, what it's like in different corporate, different corporate tracks. And now, after being able to travel around the country and talk to so many different business professionals, I've come up with three simple ways that we can all work to make our work cultures more welcoming. So number one, noticing who we're including and excluding. I've been, when I worked, in one of the groups I worked with in Morgan Stanley, I was one woman out of 20-something guys. And I noticed that. I noticed almost every day something would come up. But when I'm in a situation and there's 20-something women and one guy, I don't really notice. I really don't pay attention. I don't sit around thinking, I wonder what it's like for that guy. When we, were, when we were recruited in banking, we used to say that we were looking for candidates that were a good fit. And we would kind of describe it as, I'm looking for someone that I want to hang out with in the middle of the night. And it's true, we were going to hang out with them in the middle of the night. Um, but what would happen is we, all the resumes that we would look at were just, they were so similar. We were looking at people at the top schools, they were the top students, 4.0 resumes with five, I'm the president of, fill in the blank. And so when people would come in to interview with us, we'd have, they'd have to go through a long list of um, interviewers. And I started to notice that if that person wasn't from the right summer camp or the right prep school, people would be like, eh, at the end of the interviews, I don't know, I didn't really connect with that person. But then you bring in the right person who was part of the same secret society or rowing team or knew someone who knew someone who was at the same country club as several of the officers, then everyone was like, I love that person. You know, and everyone connected with them. And the reality is, is we connect with people that look like us. And we tend to hire people that look like us. And it's kind of natural, it happens. But the consequence of that is that there's a whole other group of people that get excluded in that process. Number two, working to create inclusive cultures. So there's a difference between diversity, which is bringing in a bunch of people that have different backgrounds and perspectives, and then actually creating, actively creating an environment where people want to stay and they feel welcome. 
So I saw in, in banking, especially the large banks, there were all these programs where you would bring in people from different backgrounds, and there's a lot of money put behind them. I actually came in on one of them. And there's a lot of effort and good things that go into that. But, what they see, but when you get there, people with different backgrounds come, they stay for a very short period, and they leave. And I remember there was all this confusion, like, oh, what happened? What just happened? We brought them in, we put, had a great program. And I remember, this is more on the obnoxious, obnoxious comment side of some of the guys I worked with, but I remember them saying, well, that's just what's going to happen because, you know, the women are going to come in. They don't want to work hard. They're just coming here and they're going to do it for a couple years and they're going to leave anyway. So that's kind of natural, right? Well, I don't remember having those conversations with women. Those weren't the conversations. The conversations were more along the lines of it was really felt isolating being there. You felt like you were being forced to fit into a culture that long term you didn't want to be a part of anyway. And it was exhausting after a while to always feel like you had to be on in this environment. So it's really, I, feel, I do feel like it's really our responsibilities to actively shape our organization's cultures and to, to keep them in hope that they become very open-minded. Not to force fit anyone who has anything different about them to actually be part of the mainstream. And number three, step up and speak up, especially when you're in a place of power. So I'm sure everyone's been in this situation where there's an inappropriate joke or inappropriate comment made about someone's ethnicity, sexual orientation, anything. It's even more important when you're not part of the group that's being made fun of to actually speak up and stand up. I can recall hearing some really elitist conversations from bankers that I worked with who made millions of dollars, who were very upset because they were being, they felt like their tax dollars were being taken by certain minority groups who were being lazy in collecting welfare. And I didn't necessarily agree with the comments, but I ignored them, and I regretted that later. Because so often we miss those small opportunities to actually step up and speak up for the people that will never be in that room. So just to wrap up, I feel like I was given this gift to be around America's top elite as an outsider. Because there I learned so early on that to be successful, I never wanted to conform to be something I wasn't. And I also learned that when you're in a very privileged place, it's so easy to forget the people that are invisible. And so I think it's important for us to all remember that it's our jobs to create these welcoming work cultures. It's not just that department over there called diversity and inclusion. It's not just their job. So let's all think about who we're excluding. Let's think about how we can make our cultures inclusive. And let's step up and speak up. Because imagine what it would be like if you were around people that loved going to work every day because they just loved the people they were with. Imagine what it would be like how productive and innovative our companies could be. Are we being the best leaders and managers and colleagues that we can be? Do the organizations that we're in actually have the right incentives in place to make people feel included? And if not, what can we do about that? Because if, even if nobody ever asks you, you have the power to make those changes. So I think we need to hold all of ourselves accountable for that today, right now, to getting where we want to be. So don't forget to step up and speak up. Thank you.